And, of course, if you're missing uh, any, you can see uh, Sister Becky Dunning. Meanwhile, take your Bible and go to the book of Nahum, chapter 1. If you have a Jack Wood Bible, it's page 1158. If you have any other, I don't know what page it is, but it's in there. It's right after the book of Micah. Thank you, thank you. All right. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Nahum chapter number one, and we will read for introduction, we'll read verses one through seven. Uh, the Bible says this, Nahum chapter one, verse number one, the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkishite. God is jealous, and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord, so much for God is love all the time. Amen. Uh, the Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, and Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world, and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. D do you see the paradigm shift there between verses 6 and 7? Mm -hmm. Who can stand before the fierceness of his anger? The Lord is good. <laughs> now here is, here's how, here's, here's the deal. Yeah, we talk about uh, his anger and all that, but look at verse 3. The Lord is slow to anger. He always, his, how he is just is, he never just starts cutting heads off. He always sends a messenger with what God expects. And a lot of times, what happens if you don't do this? God just doesn't just immediately start with wrath. He, he's slow to anger. And, and he always got the message out. He always gave people an opportunity to obey. And then when they didn't obey, he gives people an opportunity to repent and start obeying. And, uh, and the, the world, you can't help it, but, I mean, you can't. They're, lost people think like lost people. All right? That's why they don't understand how God... Uh, is just in his anger because he tells what he expects. He tells what he re requires. And so, um, so anyway, anyways, the book of Nahum uh, is Old Testament book number 34. Of course, the author is the prophet Nahum, written around 650 B.C. Note of interest is that uh, Nahum is focused mostly on the coming judgment of Nineveh, as far as story highlights, there are no stories in the book of Nahum. It is, it's uh, all has to do with prophecy against uh, Nineveh in Assyria. 
And the prophecies came true in this time period between 658 and 615 B.C. Uh, we, we read uh, the key verses there, verse 7, but also verse number 8. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall uh, pursue his enemies. So important points about the book of Nahum. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria, the nation that invaded and destroyed the northern kingdom. Now the northern kingdom was Israel. Who can remember who the southern kingdom was? Judah. Nearly uh, 100 years? 100 years. Uh, before it was judged. See, that's not a, that word is spelled correctly. That's why spell check didn't catch that word. It's just the wrong word, but it is spelled correctly. Uh, Nineveh did repent under the preaching of Jonah, but 200 years later, it was back to idolatry and violence. It's the cycle of nations. The United States is the same. We were founded upon godly principles, upon Christian principles, upon the word of God, and uh, I do not believe with, uh, with uh, uh, I, don't, I do not believe that all of the founding fathers were born again Christians. I believe a lot of them were, but some of them were deists, some of them were moral, but there was a desire uh, for, uh, for right, there was a desire for the word of God, but um, we all got mad at, uh, at Barack Obama when he said America is no longer a Christian nation, and I didn't like hearing those words, but that is a true statement. It, is, it, it was true when he said it, it was true before he said it, and, it, and it's true now. Um, it, it's the cycle. And uh, when you look at the age of the United States of America, uh, 246 years, um, uh, that's longer than most countries exist. Uh, you talk, I'm talking about modern countries or the, way, or the way they are. They change the way they were formed, the way they were founded. Um, and so, uh, so uh, all of Nineveh repents. They have a great revival under, under Jonah. And 200 years later, they were back to the way they were before Jonah preached and, and uh, they repented. Assyria was very strong at the time of Nahum's prophecy, and 40-some years after Nahum prophesied about the complete destruction of the city of Nineveh, uh, I, Brother Bill, I don't know if the, is the back door locked? Is this door locked? Somebody pulled in, so I don't know um, if, they, if they're uh, looking to get in. Uh, it's Assyrian army took Jews from the northern kingdom into exile. The ten tribes... Uh, that made up the northern kingdom completely disappeared into these and other foreign peoples. But if, you, if you're reading, I'm going through Isaiah in my devotions right now, and uh, a lot of the prophecy of Isaiah has to do with Israel being gathered back and the remnant being gathered, and they will be uh, brought back together uh, again as, a, as a, a, all into the homeland. God's word of judgment brought by Nahum against Nineveh came true in 612 B.C. when the Median army, uh, meaning the Medes and the Persians, it would be, that's what Median is, uh, uh, took it and destroyed it forever. It was excavated and dug out of the sand beginning in the 1840s. And after it was initially discovered, uh, uh, a lot of the British, uh, the British government um, spearheaded a lot of that uh, excavation there. All right, Nahum. Uh, on the next page, Nahum is a sequel to the book of Jonah because both books deal with Nineveh. However, Nahum prophesies uh, around 100 years after Jonah. The vision of Nahum records prophecies of destruction uh, against the capital of Assyria in Nineveh. There is nothing positive for the people of Nineveh in the entire book. You know, God does point out a lot of things when dealing with people, good and bad, but it's like, uh, it's like the two churches uh, in uh, Revelation. Uh, God had nothing good to say about uh, one or two of them, and he had nothing bad to say about, about uh, a couple of them. 
Uh, and so uh, the, the same is true about Nineveh here. Nothing, nothing is good or positive about that. The only positive reference in the three chapters and 47 verses of the book apply to the nation of Israel. That's chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, then verse number 13, For now will I break his yoke from off thee, and will burst thy bonds in sunder. And then verse 15, Behold upon the mountains the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feast, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass uh, through thee. He is utterly uh, cut off. Uh, I, I've noticed this next statement here reading my Bible. I, I don't know if you have noticed it. I'm sure a lot of you have. God used the heathen to punish Israel, but then God also punished the heathen for the mistreatment of his children. Yep. Uh, you know, if the Lord comes up to you and says, I got a job for you, I want you to attack my people. You're in a no-win situation there. And, uh, and so... Uh, because uh, why is that? Well, God has a job for you to do, but God also is going to keep his promise. I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. And so, uh, so, uh, uh, so be careful on that one. Amen. Uh, Assyria was a major military power prior to Babylon, but Babylon was the first worldwide kingdom under the reign of King Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel chapter 2. Uh, Assyria conquered the northern kingdoms of Israel around 722 B.C., and ba uh, Babylon conquered the southern kingdoms of Judah around 586 B.C. The vision of Nahum prophesied of the destruction and doom of Nineveh before Babylon became an international power. Nahum means comforter or compassionate. The doom of Nineveh will provide comfort uh, for the people of Israel, just as the destruction of Babylon will provide the same comfort for the Jews of the tribulation. Now, um, also, Nahum means comforter, compassionate. God used men and women who have tender hearts. He does not use, he can't use people with hard hearts. Not that he doesn't want to use people with hard hearts, but he can't use somebody that has a hard heart because they don't want to be used. And you, you wonder why God calls certain people to do certain things. Uh, it, it, you know, a lot of that has to do with their, their heart, their spirit, their willingness, uh, and so on. Nahum prophesied of the modern military weaponry during the tribulation and the destruction of the world kingdoms by the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, they did not know that at the time. All right, we, we know that, you know, prophecy by having the, you know, we've read the end of the book. We, we have the whole picture there. All right, the breakdowns. Of course, uh, Nahum would be considered a minor prophet. Nahum chapter 1, God warns Nineveh, the great Assyrian city. Number 2 is the fall of Nineveh predicted. And then Nahum 3, woes on Nineveh due to Assyrian cruelty. Now, in, interesting facts about Nahum. Uh, the only mention of him is uh, in the entire Old Testament is in chapter 1, uh, verse number 1. Nineveh had become the mightiest city on earth at the time. Now check this out. Its walls were 100 feet high. Now think about that in the timing of it. This was 600 years, 650 years before the Lord uh, uh, came, uh, before the Lord was born. There was no... There was no modern equipment to do that. So not only were the walls 100 feet high, uh, but they were wide enough to accommodate three chariots riding side by side around on the top of them. The walls were surrounded by a moat 150 feet wide and 60 feet deep. Now this was, I thought this was very interesting. It is believed that Nineveh could withstand a 20-year siege. In other words, they could hold their own for 20 years without any outside help uh, for, uh, for 20 years. Um, now, go to uh, uh, chapter 3, verse number 11. 
It's at, uh, our, in, in, our, in our notes, it says Nineveh would be hid in, in 311 and was for 2,000 uh, and was for 2,254 years until it was discovered again in 1842. In chapter 3, verse number 11, it says, Thou also shalt be drunken, thou shalt be hid, though also, thou also shalt uh, seek strength because of the enemy. The artistic writing when it comes to prophecy to me is very interesting. All right, we, we read that verse, let's just say we knew that destruction was coming, and, uh, or even if we didn't, and we, we see that expression, a prophecy against Nahum, that thou shalt be hid. What does that mean? Well, it took the destruction of it to happen and the discovery of it 2,200 years later to find out exactly what that means, that it would be hid. Um, I did see... Uh, uh, I've seen some pictures uh, of the archaeological digs and exploration of Nineveh, and there, it, it's, it's, pre it's pretty amazing uh, how uh, uh, the detail that comes out in, in a lot of those uh, uh, excavations and, and how they're able to even recreate or build models uh, and then eventually, you know, artist rendering of things. Uh, but uh, it was hit. It was hit underneath the ground. It was hit underneath the destruction for 2,200 years. All right, go over to the book of Habakkuk. All right, chapter number one. Habakkuk chapter number one. <coughs> let's read verses, excuse me, let's read verses one through four uh, to start out with. The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear, even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save? Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoil, now I didn't say God caused him to do iniquity. It said, why dost thou show me iniquity? You know one of the things that, we have to deal with in this life is we have to look at a lot of sin. I mean, on top of our own. Okay? In addition, it's bad enough I got to look at mine, but we, there, we have to see, you know, we have to see it all around us, all right? Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that rise up strife, uh, raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth, for the wicked doth uh, compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Uh, he's not talking about wrong judgment from God. He's talking about wrong judgment from man. Uh, so basically Habakkuk, uh, we can identify with Habakkuk as far as all the stuff that we have to see. All the stuff that is going on in the, in the world today, and, and we have to see it. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but uh, if, if we, uh, we ought to feel like strangers more and more. We're just pilgrims passing through. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's uh, everything is not getting better, everything is getting worse. All right? Uh, Habakkuk is the 35th. Uh, Old Testament book, uh, the prophet Habakkuk. This also would be uh, a minor, uh, a minor prophet. Um, story highlights: like Nahum, there are no stories, only prophecy. Uh, and in prophecy, some prophets came through or uh, came true in this time period uh, si uh, between 608 and, and 598 B.C. Uh, key verses, uh, chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. That is the same thing about the end times prophecy. 
All right? It, it's go, it is going to come. You know, the, the, the coming of the Lord has been at the door for 2,000 years. And it, it is on its way. And I like what it says there, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. You want to know why we say something tarries? Because we're expecting it by now. The Lord is not late. The rapture of the church is not late. People say, well, if the Lord tarries his coming, he's, he hasn't tarried his coming. He just knows when it's going to be. All right? We think he's waiting. We think he's, you know, late. We think he should have happened by now, but he, he, he's got it under control. Um, and so, uh, and it says there, write the vision, make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Did you ever want to find out something? You found it out, and then you wish you didn't find it out? It's kind of like, it's kind of like this, you know? You, fi- you find out what the destruction is, and then you, <laughs> then you run away. All right? Wish you didn't know it. Important points about the book. Habakkuk, uh, well, let me put that notes of interest there. This book has often been an encouragement for people to cry out to the Lord in times of trouble uh, like Habakkuk did. You know... We've heard it said a million times. All these authors of these books of the Bible, all these prophets, they were people just like we were people, our people, or were people. I don't know what we are now, but uh, but they were just they were just common folks, just just like we're common folks. And um, so let's go back down to the bottom. Habakkuk cried out to God during a very dark time in Israel. He likely prophesied in the first five years of King uh, Jehoiakim's reign. This king uh, led the people into evil. The Assyrians had control of the northern kingdom, Israel. After a brutal invasion more than 100 years earlier, Habakkuk preached from the southern kingdom of Judah, which was still intact, but less than 50 years away from its own invasion by Babylon that destroyed uh, the temple. So he's, he's in Judah, he's in the southern kingdom, prophesying about what is going to happen against the northern kingdom, but that also, the southern kingdom is also on, on track uh, for destruction uh, and an invasion and, uh, and an exile. The book begins with a heartfelt prayer to God, full of anguish about the evil Habakkuk was seeing around him. You know, as children of God, Instead of getting mad at what we see around us, we, it ought to break our heart at what we see going on around us. I understand be angry and sin not. I understand righteous indignation. But our initial reaction ought to be one of a broken heart. When, when we hear uh, the government come out with, uh, with some anti-God or anti-right or anti-moral law or decree... Uh, I'm flesh just like everybody else's flesh, and most of the time my reaction is I get mad. But it, it should be one of it should be one of heartbreak. It, it, we were down on the street yesterday afternoon. We've been going on Tuesday mornings. We went in the afternoon yesterday, and uh, I was uh, I didn't know what to expect. We, we were down we were down in Dexter a few weeks ago, and didn't I, I don't think we had maybe one person. Uh, that actually walked by, but yesterday we had a bunch of foot traffic yesterday, and uh, and a lot of uh, uh, a lot of uh, I would say I don't know maybe 75, 80 percent of the people took tracks that uh, that Carter handed them. Him and I were standing together, uh, but it, but it's funny too because we'll see. I've watched uh, Jeremy and Charity, and and yesterday Emma was with them across the street, and and I've seen people walk across the street on purpose, go way around them to avoid them. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, down, at the, uh, down at the other corner, uh, uh, there was somebody walking, and they walked behind Mission Impeachable and came out past where uh, Brother Bill and Sister Jean were standing on there just to avoid eye contact with these religious nuts, right? But... My flesh gets stirred up. And, and you remember what Brother Hardman says when, when you go to witness to somebody, what's, what's the, usually most of the time, what do they say? I'm good. 
Everybody that did not take a track from Carter yesterday, or almost everybody, I'm good. I'm good. And, uh, and, and you know, sometimes they're polite about it. Uh, sometimes they're not polite or rude. They just, they just look at you like, why are you talking to me? But they don't say nothing. You know, it's almost like I wish they would say I'm good, you know, just to acknowledge. But, you know, if you let your flesh get in control, you get mad. But remember what God told, uh, was it Isaiah or, or Jeremiah? I can't remember who, who he told. They haven't, re- or, uh, no, Samuel. They haven't rejected you. They rejected me. It should be one of a broken heart, not anger or, or upset. And, uh, and people say, well, if they just knew what they were missing. Yeah, but there was a time you didn't know what you were missing. And so don't, you know, remember that. Uh, God responded with a prophecy, uh, the second little bullet there at the bottom. God responded with a prophecy that was general. Unlike other minor prophets, Habakkuk was not given the names of specific places that would fall. It was a promise that God was in charge, and no matter what happened, justice would occur in the end. Well, why wouldn't God give specific names and all that kind of stuff? Well, if you're doing right, you ain't got nothing to worry about. And so uh, that's, I guess that you could say that would be the the principle uh, on that one. Uh, Habakkuk prophesied before the captivity of Judah by Babylon. Uh, We're already there in chapter 1, verse 6. It says, For for lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling uh, places that are not theirs. Habakkuk reveals a unique approach of searching the mind of God by asking questions about the ambiguities between the holiness, justice, and mercy of God. You have to remember, to understand God even somewhat, you have to understand and take into consideration all of his attributes. Yes, he is a God of love, but he's not just a God of love. He is a God of judgment. Yes, he is a God of mercy, and, but, and he is a God of long-suffering, but he's also a God of wrath. And so you have, to, uh, you have to take it all into consideration. You have to always remember that when dealing with things like prophecy, especially if it's a, a prophecy against destruction or captivity, uh, you have to take it, all of that into account. Our human nature wants to think about just the positive things about God. And sometimes we even want to, you know, even after we're saved, we want to think about that, just the positive things. But even if we're saved, he is a God of grace and he's a God of forgiveness, but he's also a God of of chastisement. And so you've got to look at the whole uh, picture. Uh, He saw the punishment of the sins of the people of Israel by another wicked nation in Babylon. But Babylon did not have the blessing uh, of a covenant with God. And and again, like Nahum, God uses the heathen to punish his people, but God also punishes the heathen. And uh, and so that's that catch-22 I was telling you. Habakkuk realized these ambiguities in his mind. Uh, were no doubt his own lack of understanding because he knew that God's answers were going uh, to reprove him. Uh, Let's just look there at chapter 2, verse 1. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. He knew that he could be needed to be set straight or in his mind, even if, even if it's just in his thinking. Um, Habakkuk did fear the words of God. He said in chapter 3, verse 2, uh, well, verse 1, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet upon uh, Shigenoth, O Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years make known in wrath, remember mercy. Um, again, we ought, we ought to live in the fear of God. Even as saved, born-again children of God, we ought to live in the fear of God. Um, the main subjects of the book are the doctrines of the tribulation and the glorious return of the Lord Jesus. 
the words the end and Selah, and I believe Habakkuk is the only other, I believe, don't hold me exactly to this, but I believe it's the only other verse, uh, book other than Psalms where the word Selah uh, is used. I can find out quick enough. Hold on. Praise the Lord for Esword. I'm glad I looked it up. I'm lying. Second Kings, uh, it's in Second Kings, um, is, an, is, a, is a location. He took Selah by war. But uh, in Habakkuk uh, 3.9, the bow was made uh, quite naked according to the oaths of the tribes, even thy word, Selah. And then in chapter 3, uh, verse uh, uh, it says there in that text there 13, or 3.3, 3, but it's 3.13. Uh, the wicked of the tribulation will oppress the Jews and endure the plagues in a drunken stupor of liquor and drugs. Sec, uh, chapter 2, verse 5 through 17. Revelation chapter 9, verse 21. But the Lord Jesus Christ will return and thresh the heathen for their wickedness. You know, you ever think about this? I was talking with Brother Hardman a little bit about that. Like, we, we know that the wicked... And I'm not talking about the, the ignorant, the blinded, but I'm talking about the powers that be, right? We know they're going to get their, whatever you want to say, they're going to suffer the wrath of God, right? They're going to get their just reward. In my flesh, which is wicked, I don't want, to, I don't want God to wait that long, right? I want to see it happen now, but... Of course, I want him to be merciful with me, so amen. All right, the breakdowns of the book. Chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, uh, Habakkuk cries out to God. Uh, verses 5 through 11, God's reply, prophecy about Babylon. Uh, verses 12 through 17, Habakkuk's worship uh, reply. Chapter 2, verse 1, Habakkuk call, uh, calls out to God. Uh, verses 2 through 20, God give. Uh, gives woes for ex, uh, extortion, greed, and sin. And then chapter 3, uh, Habakkuk's uh, beautiful worship. I've also heard the book of Habakkuk pronounced Habakkuk, okay? Potato, potato. Pronounce it however you want to pronounce it. Uh, interesting facts about this book. Three chapters, 56 verses, 1,475 words. Habakkuk sees the increased wickedness among the people and wants to know why God allows such wickedness to go on. God raised up Babylon to chastise Judah. God told Habakkuk that Babylon would be his chastening rod against Judah. Babylon began to rise in power during the reign of uh, Nabopolassar, uh, 625 to 605. By the time of Jehoiakim, uh, who was the 18th king of Judah, Babylon had become the undisputed world power. So we're talking about replacing Babylon. Uh, um, Nineveh and Assyria. The, successful, the successor of Nabopolassar's was uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and he came to power in 605 BC uh, and carried out a number of successful military campaigns in the West, advancing into Palestine and Egypt. He deported some, uh, Nebuchadnezzar did, he deported some 10,000 Jewish captives. Uh, from the area of Jerusalem to Babylon, some 900 miles away. Would you think about that? Back then, 900 miles away, that was like on the other side of the world. I mean, uh, 900 miles today is, you know, in the mode of transportation, uh, modes of transportation we have today, that's nothing. But back then, that was quite, that was quite a uh, logistical feat getting that far away. Included in this group of captives, and this is interesting, were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Don't forget that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's the names that the king gave them. That's not their Jewish names. And so uh, I, uh, I remember Brother Hardman preaching a message 25 years ago, don't change your name. And don't let the world change your name. Uh, and, um, and so I've, I've tried since then, since I heard that message, to make it a point of referring to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And uh, 
So you got to change your dog's name to Hananiah. You, you done gave it the wrong name, a worldly name. All right, so that is uh, Nahum and Habakkuk. Uh, then uh, next time we'll look at uh, 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 Zephaniah and, uh, and Haggai, and then, uh, and then we'll probably do, uh, we'll definitely do Z- uh, Zechariah by itself. Uh, more than likely, may, we might do it with Malachi. And then we'll be done. We've got just four more books of the Old Testament, and, um, and then we will be done. Okay.